and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you so much for taking time out and being here. I'm also very happy to start the webinar today. My name is Ayong. I am the Marketing and Educational Seminar Coordinator here at Neo Biotech. I, and I am also the moderator for this webinar. And this is me right here. Hello and welcome again. And please also stay connected with us on social media. Our Facebook page is Neobiotech USA and our Instagram is Neobiotech underscore USA and also YouTube channel is Neobiotech USA. So stay connected with us. And today's agenda is very simple. It's to introduce our topic and the presenter. And I will make an announcement right after the lecture in regard to the upcoming webinars, as well as previous webinars. And lastly, how to receive your C credits. So please stay until the end. And today's topic is the fundamental of reach splitting with our Dr. Mike Chen. And also, we will have a Q&A session at the end. So submit your questions through this Q&A box right here. And one thing that I want to address is Dr. Chen may not answer all of your questions since we have a short period of time. But um, you could uh, email him uh, if you have any further questions. So let's get started. Um, let's have Dr. Chen to start today's webinar. Good morning, Dr. Chen, or good afternoon, Dr. Chen. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> Good morning, Ayang. Good morning, doctors. Welcome to Monday morning, bright and shine, uh, which is nice because last night it was raining like crazy, um, but it's nice to see the sun out. I hope everybody has a nice, comfortable weekend. Um, so without any little delay, let's get started. Let me get the screen set up. Okay. So for those of you who don't know uh, who I am, my name is Dr. Mike Chen. Um, I've practiced in San Jose uh, for the last 30 years. Um, my email is drmike at sjimplantdent.com. For those of you who might have questions or, or anything that, um, that you might want to ask me, uh, you can email me there. Um, I've been teaching for almost 20 years. I've been uh, in and out of the, the dental school, and but mostly now I'm dealing privately with the uh, implant company and uh, in teaching. We do, we do do a good program, uh, an exciting program the last few years is the uh, live hands-on work in Tijuana, Mexico. Uh, for those of you that are interested in sharpening your skill or learning uh, the implant dentistry. Uh, in placing implant. Um, if you're interested in something like that, please contact your sales rep and they can give you more information. Uh, but importantly is that uh, this class uh, maximum attendance is only five doctors. We do not like to see more. So you get the one-on-one -on -one, uh, learning experience. So with that uh, being said, uh, let's get started. Today's topic, it's about ridge splitting, the fundamental of ridge splitting. It's very exciting because this is something that not too many of us are doing, but, but more and more doctors are doing it because the tools that we have today uh, are by far um, much improved. So with that being said, let's get started. So ridge splitting or ridge expansion osteotomy is a technique in which the bone, bony ridge of the jaw is literally expanded and mechanically uh, yeah, kind of, you know, express the open, so to say, um, basically to restore the lost dimension um, that the jaw um, went through over time because when the tooth were extracted, probably it wasn't uh, grafted it, and or they had a denture over it. So the, the bone has some atrophy uh, over it. And usually what we don't uh, talk about is not just the bone, but it's about the soft tissue. So it's important that we also focus on the soft tissue in the sense that the attached gingiva is also have to be present. So this is something that was introduced by Dr. Tatum in 1970. Um, and then in 1994, Dr. Summer uh, did a basically kind of like a, a little research uh, similar to that of Dr. Tatum. And you know, over five years, he had a 
great success rate at 98.8%, um, which is exciting. And then more and more of other uh, research that shows that this is a viable technique in the, for those with people that have deficiency in, in the width of the alveolar ridge. Now, the advantages. The advantages of wrist splitting is obviously you can, for the most area, you can be able to expand the bone and place implant all at the same time instead of doing two surgeries. And of course, with the improvement in the armamentarium, um, it makes the surgery more predictable. And most importantly, it's more comfortable for the patient to go through it. Uh, this procedure can enhance and help the hard and soft tissue profile, especially up in the anterior because you're basically expanding the bone and reshaping the area a little bit to bring back that, that aesthetic uh, uh, deficiency that was lost. Um, it help improve the bone density around the implant, obviously, because you're increasing the volume. Um, it also helps um, the proper diameter implant to be placed because one of the things that we do see is that a lot of time, doctor, you know, like tooth number 19 area, they find the ridge to be too narrow, so they went in there and they decided to put a 3.5 diameter implant instead of something that is at least four or wider, um, because usually the 3.5, it's, it's just uh, too minimal and the chance of something else happening uh, could, be, could be more, um, not so good. In the alternative to possible more complicated, uh, you know, the old way, of doing things is you probably have to do a block bone or heavy uh, titanium mesh with a screw. Um, so it's a little more invasive the old way. With the with this, it sounds invasive, but with the proper armamentarium, I think it's it's uh, pretty straightforward as you will see as we go on. Now, when it's not recommended in doing is when there's no uh, bone between the two cortical plate, meaning the cancellous bone. Um, or you have severe undercut, uh, mostly, most time is on the buccal side, the labial area, uh, at the more apical region. So when you expand, the fracture uh, is much more uh, uh, increased, so to say. Um, or the buccal uh, cortical plate is compromised. It's just way too thin. So when you do try to put pressure on it, it's gonna break. Um, or the ridge is too narrow. So anything, when you're looking at the, uh, the ridge, you're doing examination, Anything that is you know, less than three or four millimeter, you probably just want to do a GBR, uh, basic GBR over it and then come back later. Um, you know, and then the edentulous area, mesial distally, you want to make sure you have enough room to be able to place the implant. So anything that's less than seven millimeter, it's not ideal. You have to remember, to support the papilla, you need actually at least a millimeter and a half or two on the mesial and on the distal side. So if I place an implant, I have to make sure the mesial distal hasn't sufficient enough of bone to support the soft tissue there. Um, and or area like a D1 area, which is the lower anterior chin area, sometimes it's so dense that you're probably not able to expand um, those area as well as, as, as you would like. Um, the disadvantages, sudden fracture, that's the biggest fear that we, that we have and that's what, a lot of doctors are kind of shy away um, because they put too much pressure uh, too fast um, or not able to split the bone, uh, the ridge, when the, the cortical plate, one of them is missing. Obviously, you need two cortical plate to be able to expand it because remember, it is a sandwiching technique where you're basically opening up the bone, creating a sandwich by putting in the implants in the bone, so to say. The possible crestal bone resorption, because you try to expand it, you put so much force on it, that resorption can occur. That's a, that's a very high possibility. Um, so in doing these procedures, you need to take your time. You need to be patient. You need to allow the bone to stretch. It's just like before we exercise, we have to stretch. By stretching, then you're, you're, you're making sure your muscle, your tendons are all well-tuned and prepared you know, to, to be able to go work out. So tools, we need tools. Well, first and foremost, you need a good case. So obviously you have to say, do I have at least four millimeters of bone buckled lingually? And visual exam, palpation with your hands, making sure that the ridge is all the way straight down or straight up, uh, buckled lingually, there's no undercut or curve. 
so that we have sufficient enough bone to expand it. And then the next thing is bone graft. The material, what kind of bone grafting material do you like to use to make it work you know, efficiently so that it will convert into the patient's own bone? Membrane, remember you need to use a membrane because you have to contain the bone, everything that's, that you place in there, i.e. implants and bone, and secure it so that there's no movement at all. Suture, obviously we need a good suture that gotta last more than two weeks. So silk is out of, you know, it's out of the question. You have to use something that can stay there for minimum of a month or so, so that the tissue, give the time for the tissue to, to, to close up. Obviously with a kit, you need a long fissure burr to create your, your initial osteotomy. You need some type of disc or saw to create the opening. Uh, you need a spreader, um, so something that to help the expanding. You need an expander, which basically mimic the shape of the implant to slowly also help expanding. Um, these are tools, there are many different tools that are out there that are sold individually. Um, and, and it can be stressful because some are good, some are not, and you, you don't know what to buy. Um, some doctors like to use piezo to do it. That's another option. That, that you have, um, but I, I wouldn't start out with that right away. So you need to get the feel of doing this first. So you take a look at the tools and you can see uh, with the bone spreader, uh, the tips of it, it's usually flat. You have to have a nice mallet, or with this, you can just slowly pushing in. The pushing, I think it's kind of dangerous, so to say, because you, you cannot control the amount of force that's, that you're applying. Sometimes it might be too much and then suddenly you hear a crack, and everything is it's yeah you know, stopped. And here's a little more of the bone spreader. Again, when you have the spreader, um, remember they're also thin to slowly get thicker and thicker, meaning wider and wider as they allow the to push the bone apart, so to say. Okay. And this is more a close-up look. And when you look at the marking on there, that just tells you the depth that you have gone in. Um, usually you want to take it down to as far as you can go uh, for, for the depth of the implant uh, if you can. But sometimes you might not. You might just want to go halfway and then use the expander uh, to slowly do it. And here are the bone expander. Now they basically mimic that of the implant. Uh, but the, again, this starts out, you know, you can see, you can see over here, it starts out 1.8, 2.6 and then all the way just up higher and higher. But most importantly is that these expanders can be used uh, with a hand instrument or hand torque. Um, you know, again, it's again on what you are comfortable with, with uh, using. Um, some of these expanders are not uh, rounded or tip or sharp, they are flat. Um, again, it's for different reason, different usage, uh, and what your comfort zone could, uh, is like. So with a saw, you want to make sure you make your cut literally right down the middle of the bone, okay? And usually, if usually if you have, let's say, a 10 millimeter wide diameter, uh, you obviously you probably have a radius of give or take five millimeter. So your depth your vertical depth is about five. This is actually a good uh, x-ray, uh, not x-ray, a good picture to, to show you that when you palpate and feel the bone, feel the buckle and feel the lingual to make sure that the ridge is wide. The ridge has a nice uh, normal saddle, so to say, um, so that it, it expands or it, it's thick at the end and not concave, that it will, if you expand this area, this bone will crack. So visual exam, x-ray, CT will also definitely be very, very helpful. Uh, this is what you don't want, the hourglass. is very common in the anterior where you have a nice wide base buccal lingually, but as you go apically, then this concavity is seen. And when you do expand, this bone is too thin and you get a fracture and that's what you don't want. And this unfortunately do happen. So obviously when you do examination, when you see something like that, that's less than four millimeter, um, you know, wrist splitting is not ideal. You probably want to do the GBR to widen the bone in that fashion. Um, so visual exam, hand palpation on top of the imaging is extremely important to have 
so that you can make a proper diagnosis with the patient. Also, when you look at the look at the attached gingiva. If you have the attached gingiva, then it's not an issue. It's it's totally fine. If you don't, probably this will be the time to do the soft tissue graft before anything else. I tend to like to do the graft, soft tissue graft first to create some stability and bring uh, the vascularity into the area. And then when I do do the graft uh, as second stage, I have enough tissue that's there to help support the graft. So the planning is obviously, you gotta have some imaging, i.e. you know some type of uh, PA panoramic, the best is still CT, of course, so you have a three-dimensional view. Visually, you have to look at the soft tissue. You want to make sure the attached gingiva is readily available and plentiful all the way around, mm -hmm. and that the buccolingual width is adequate, ideally four millimeters or more. The horizontal, mesial distally, you need a minimum, ideally seven or more. And then mm -hmm. vertically, make sure you have enough depth that you can split it and you can place an adequate size uh, implant. You wanna be able to do this procedure so that we can do place the required diameter implant there to be so that once you restore it, that implant is strong enough to support the restoration. Obviously the density of the bone is important. Uh, this back here in number 19 area, it's a D2 bone, which is quite dense when you think about it. Um, so you might have to add a special uh, extra procedure, which I will talk to you about in a few minutes later. Um, the, so the horizontal vertical cut is something that is going to help in expanding the bone, but you don't want to cut it too much that it will cause poss possible fracture. So on the imaging, you want to see this bone to be, basically, you can see between the two, it's pretty even, and that's nice. So when you do do the expansion, it should open up quite nicely. If this area is dividend or this area is dividend, then we might have some problem. So you want to make sure you have the good height, a good width, and anatomically, you know, enough room to be away from the sinus or enough room to be away from the nerve that we can place an adequate uh, implant length to be in that space. So let's take a look, you know, with something that doesn't go as planned. So I got a ridge over here. You know, it's pretty narrow and you know, not the most ideal. So we slowly, slowly take our time doing what we're supposed to do, go through the steps. And then once we went through the step and when we're placing the implant, crack. So that's why when you do this, even when you're placing the implant, take your time. We're able to salvage it because we see the fracture occurring. We removed this implant, went back in to slowly expand it more and then place the implant in. Over here, we have perforation in that area. So we have to make sure we bone graft it. As long as the bone, everything is still intact, even though you have a fracture, you still can repair and save it. And obviously bone graft the area, membrane, and achieve primary closure. Uh, and no, any type of temporary restoration, make sure there's no pressure on these implants and the bone and allow it to heal and it should be fine. Same thing in this situation, can this be repaired? And I think that you can, you have the implant in there and you have this area which is basically, it thins out or it chipped away. As you place the implant, you thought you might have enough bone but as you place the implant, that buccal plate is too thin. So as a uh, side note, we know the buccal plate on average in the anterior is probably about a millimeter, at best a millimeter and a half. So we want to make sure we, we have enough bone there. And then once we place the implants, we also want to kind of overgraft it because we know we need a minimum of at least two millimeters circumferentially around the implant for that implant to be successful. So another thing is when we make that horizontal saw cut, we want to make sure we extend it a little bit, especially on an edential patient. Well, that makes it easier. But if there's adjacent tooth next to it, you don't want to extend it and cut the uh, cementum of the, of the adjacent tooth. You want to make sure you have enough room to extend it a little bit. So when you do the expansion, it gives you that little elasticity so that it, it relieves the stress and we can place the implant without too much of a tension in the area. 
So on average, um, away from the natural tooth, it's about a millimeter and a half. Okay, so you want to stay away for at least a millimeter and a half away. And when you do use this to go in and divide the osteotomy, make sure you divide the osteotomy right in half. Okay, right in the center. So that's why you take that initial drill, create your osteotomy, and so you know where the implant should go, and then the saw goes in to divide it. And so you basically, as we said, you split the bone. And then you can start expanding. So in this situation, you have good adequate amount of bone. Down here, you can see the osteotomy, the saw. This is this pretty clean, and you have good thickness on both buccal lingual. Even with this situation, you can see with the thickness, you still will lose some of the crestal area. So it's important that we take this implant when we place it, we do bury it a little bit, and we do graft the whole thing and membrane the whole thing so we can recoup what was lost a little bit. Again, this is just another picture to show you with the expansion, with the sawing right down the middle. And you have good thickness here, good thickness here. Again, you do have a little loss of bone on the buccal and lingual at the crestal. So you want to submerge this implant just a bit so that is, it's buried. Now, obviously, after we place the implant, we graft, we graft the area. This obviously, you know, this is just more for show to show you that we, you know, we have to graft, but we didn't, we, this is kind of a little bit of an overkill. But you do want to graft the area and then make sure the tissue is able to be closed over with the membrane and then suture firm, not overly tight as this you can see. You can see the compression of the tissue, the blanching of the tissue. When you have too much blanching, what we lost, what we will lose is the vascularity. And if we lose the vascularity, the bone um, sometimes will, uh, will be lost. So we have to be careful. Um, you know, sometimes if you cannot achieve primary closure, um, then you probably should use uh, maybe a, a non resolvable membrane. We'll go through that too, okay? So, well, here we come with the membrane. What is the quality of the membrane? We wanna make sure it, bio, it has the biocompatibility, meaning that this is not gonna irritate the host tissue. Um, the host tissue will recognize it, and, but it's not gonna create an, an inflammatory response. It's cell occlusiveness, okay? So we wanna make sure they keep the tissue where they are, that they're not gonna go in and mix with the, uh, uh, with, with the graph material. Also, most importantly, is to maintain the space so that we have the volume. We don't lose the volume or the bone will not be compressed. It gives you that, that, that kind of like a, a, a wall, a wall to prevent the bone from being spread apart. And then also, it's, you know, so it can integrate with the host tissue. Again, no irritation. And bottom line is a good ease of use, easy to use. You have some membrane out there, it's way too soft, and it's difficult to manipulate. Some membrane out there is way too rigid, it's very difficult to manipulate. And when you have that problem, it makes your uh, surgery a little bit more cumbersome, and, uh, it, and, and it, you, know, you might get into some problems, okay? So, Two types of membrane, really. First of all, we have resorbable membrane. So the, with the resorbable membrane, we have the collagen membrane, which is usually, usually uh, allergenic or xenograft sources, and they facilitate primary wound closure, ideally. Um, mainly it's type one collagen fiber. Now type one is mainly uh, yeah, all of our body, it's everything. Uh, the uh, type two is like uh, cartilage and, and, and so on. But so this is readily available. It's a lot um, and, and, and it's, it, you know, it's something that, that it, uh, the body tend to accept it pretty nicely. And again, depending on the brand that you purchase, they will resorb within three months to 12 months. Um, there are different brands out there. So you have to make sure when you purchase them, you wanna know how long they will stay. Ideally, I like the membrane to resorb um, by six months, um, because you want to make sure that the bone converts completely. Um, usually, if you do use the allergenic one, it should convert quite fast. Uh, Zytograph, pretty much the same too, um, but alle allergenic one is, I, I think, is better. Um, and then you have the synthetic 
membrane, which is basically um, something that uh, is becoming more and more popular. Um, you know, they're made of these uh, two chemicals and resorption is about the same. And, you know, there's the company out there, I think it's called EpiGuide is one of them, or Guide Door is the other one. Um, they're very popular. They've been around for a while. Uh, some people like it, some people don't. And the reason because of the synthetic membrane is quite rigid and, uh, and it's, it's very difficult to manipulate sometimes. Now with these membrane, collagen or synthetic, you can adjust them, you can cut them. Um, you just wanna make sure that you, know, you, you when you place these membrane that you are away from the adjacent tooth. Don't clump onto the adjacent tooth, cement them uh, because you're gonna create irritation and possible bone bone loss too. And then obviously we have the non-resorbable one, which is the PTFE. Well, what's interesting is that PTFE is basically another word for it, it's Teflon. It's used in other uh, parts of our, of our uh, everyday life. Um, but the old Teflon is just straightforward, high density macro pores. Uh, I mean, it works well, but with the new uh, expanded version, which is micropore, um, which basically have a smaller nodule and a, you know, it's texture on both sides. So it's not you have to. It's not just you have to place uh, specifically. You can use either side and it's fine. So it's more easier to use and uh, easier to manipulate. And it is quite strong. It doesn't tear that easily. Now the next step up of this non-resorbable membrane is the titanium reinforced. Uh, PTFE, which basically these titanium comes in different shape. It's embedded in the in the PTFE, and you're able to help maintain the space volume. Uh, usually, I will use the titanium reinforced one if I have to apply more than one cc of bone, um, because when you have more than that, uh, you tend to uh, they, they tend to migrate. So with the titanium, it will hold it in place. Uh, remember, when we do bone graphing, immobilization of the graft is number one. It is key. So go to bone graphing material. Um, I just want to make it because, you know, we only have one hour, so we're going to keep this really simple. And so obviously, if I have something that's osteoinductive, osteoconductive, and oste that has osteogenic, all three, it's the golden standard. And the golden standard is basically it's the autogenous bone, which is the patient's own bone. But besides that, we're not gonna have all three. So you're gonna have at least two uh, to work with. So this two is still better than none. So basically, when you look at your graph material, you wanna see what does it have? And because that also will determine uh, how long will it take for the graph material to convert into the patient's own bone. So with the autogenous bone, golden standard, is what we just talked about, it has the osteogenesis, it has the induction, and it has the conduction, osteoconduction. Now, osteoconduction, pretty much all of them will have. It basically gives you the scaffold, or if I can say a chicken wire, so for the bone to be able to attach onto there. And so when you have something like that, like let's say a synthetic bone, um, that's all it has, and it's going to take a while for that to, to, uh, to, to fill up or to grow. Um, osteogenesis obviously is something that's, that's excellent if we can have it, uh, but that's only with the patient's own bone. Uh, osteoinduction, is, you know, for a simple term, uh, the body recruits all the different cells around the area and then basically turn them into osteoblast so they can grow bone. So you have allograft, which is cadaver. It has induction and conduction. Animal, conduction, some induction, synthetic, conduction. These all will work pretty well. My favorite is still, um, you know, uh, the osteogenesis, allograft, alloplast. Xenograft, I like to do use it if I do a sandwiching technique, which I like to have them on the outside because xenograft is a volume builder. It creates a nice volume, so basically it will uh, change the deficiency area into a nice uh, fullness. Um, but I don't like that touching the implant. I like the any of the other three touching the implant because of the remodeling. Then sutures. Um, there's a whole bunch of sutures out there, but I picked out four that is common. The first one is silk, which is braided, non-absorbable. It's coated with wax, so it's you know easy to use and it's strong. And but you have to remove it in two weeks, mainly because 
in two weeks, if you don't remove it, this suture will have so much plaque on there, it actually can cause an infection or irritation to the soft tissue. So if you're doing bone grafting, you probably don't want to use silk at all. So with ridge splitting, GBR, you know, any type of these type of bone grafting, uh, silk is not a choice uh, to use, but it's something that is very common on an everyday work. PGA is basically is a synthetic uh, braided and it's a very strong suture. Uh, it's something that's that's nice to use and usually they will be around for at least four weeks to, to, to eight weeks. Uh, again, different the type of brand that you purchase. Now, the cheaper version is nylon. Nylon is monofilament, non-resorbable, easy to use, very smooth, very strong. So it's very comfortable as far as manipulating it. The only uncomfortable part is once you tie your knot and you do your cut, that area where you cut, it's very sharp. And that is very irritating to the patient. So some doctors like to do the knot on the buckle side, but when it's on the buckle side, your cheek is gonna be rubbing on it. And so either way, there's gonna be discomfort. So one of the way to prevent that, if you wanna use nylon to prevent that is take a Bunsen burner, take in, uh, any instruments that you like or that you're not, don't, you're not gonna use, uh, heat it up till it's kind of golden, and then just touch the, uh, the cut area to make it blunt. So after you do that, then it's more forgiving on the, on the patient's soft tissue. Um, again, nylon is by far the least expensive um, and they work very well, but again, comfort, it's important on the patient. Uh, PTFE, non-resorbable, monofilament, very strong, biologically inert with soft monofilament designed to prevent bacterial wicking, meaning this stuff, bacteria will stick to it. So like the membrane, we, you know, one thing with the membrane, with the PTFE membrane, as with the suture, bacteria will not uh, stick to it well. And so that if you cannot achieve primary closure, you wanna use a PTFE membrane, but if you can use suture in any of these bone graphing, uh, use PTFE because you know it can stay in there for a few weeks without any issue at all. So membrane is needed primary closure. So we want to make sure you get the membrane to close over the graft and the, the expansion area. Make sure you stay about a millimeter and a half away from the adjacent tooth. Achieving primary closure is a must. And then once you do that, make sure if this is nylon, blunt the end where you cut it and allow it to heal. When you see something like this, you know, you have a, a ridge that is, you know, Barely enough, probably four, three to four millimeters, three in some area, four in some area. Um, you got to make sure that as you go upward, if this is maxillary, as you go upward to the apical region, that, the, that you have sufficient bone to expand because this is where the hourglass uh, um, shape will be seen most commonly in the anterior. And then when you do the sawing, you want to make sure you're right down the middle. And then once you do the expansion and place the implant, um, when you, before you even place the implant, make sure your angulation is proper so that when you restore it, it's good. Bone graft, everything around it, membrane, and then achieve primary closure. As in this patient, patient has a temporary uh, acrylic bridge that we can cement back onto the canine. So leading towards the Ridge Wider Kit. And this is something that I'm really excited. I really like this tool. Main thing, it has everything that you need in one small kit. And, and basically you don't need to, well, you, not basically, you don't need to buy anything else. This will help do the splitting all in one. Um, so first and foremost, you have the bone trimmer. The bone trimmer at first is once you do your flap, you usually see the ridge on the upper crestal area to be sometime, if I can use the term knife edge or just narrow, you wanna make sure you flatten that because if you try to do an osteotomy or try to do a saw on it, it's not gonna to work too well. So you wanna flatten the crestal area so you will see about probably you know four millimeters of bone, buccolingually. And then look at the, the picture in there where you can see some indentation. This is a nice trick, a nice technique 
where you place the indentation where the implant will go. So you know you, your spacing. So obviously, uh, if you're going to be placing bicuspid, you want to know what your mesial distal uh, width of the bicuspid. Molar, also mesial distal, so you can space it out accordingly. And then once you do that, you want to take your initial drill, which has the diameter of about one and a half millimeter. You want to go ahead and make your osteotomy right down the middle of the bone. And you're running this at about 1200 RPM. Now with these three stopper, it is designed for this initial drill. So basically you don't wanna go in all the way sometime. You wanna, you know, some doctor like to go in and make the indentation and maybe take an X-ray. And just to see if the angulation is proper, everything looks good, then they will take it down a little bit deeper until they get to achieve the length. So the stopper is nice, so it, it gives you that little safety mechanism built in. This is the exciting part. Once we have the osteotomy created, verified it with the x-ray, we will use the saw. And the saw, as you can see, um, the, the radius is two, three, five millimeter. As you see on your right, you see the three saw accordingly. And the interesting, the great part about this, you have a little shell that's around it. That is your stopper for the saw. So you don't go all the way down or you slip or anything. This stopper will actually will give you or show you that you have achieved two millimeter, three millimeter, five millimeter as you go down uh, and achieve that vertical cut. And this is nice is so that it's another protective mechanism that's built in. Now, when you're in dense bone area, just having the horizontal cut is not enough um, most of the time because if you try to expand that, um, chances of fracture are pretty high. So with that being said, we need to do what we call a buckle vertically cut, okay? Or should I say vertically horizontal cut on the buckle side. Um, and this is the fourth saw where you see the red arrow, it's right on this end. And this saw basically will allow you to go in one millimeter. So when you do a vertical cut, and then on the buckle, horizontal cut on the buckle, it can only go in one millimeter. What that does is that it takes that dense bone, when we do start to do the expansion, it will slowly, slowly expand and basically soften the possibility of fracture. So that we wanna make sure we do a cut. Again, not being afraid because I have the stopper in place. So I'm going to make sure the stopper is rubbing against the bone. So I got my one millimeter depth, you know, horizontally and then vertically. And as you can see on the right hand side. Then once I achieve that, I will use my bone chisel. The bone chisel has three markings, three millimeter, five millimeter, seven millimeter. And the important thing is, you will, will you, let's say if you have three osteotomy, obviously I'm gonna do the middle one first, then I'll go to the left or right, and then to the third one. And you do that so that the bone will not expand overly or stress on one side and not on the other side. You wanna keep the pressure even all the way across. And what you do is you tap it in, you take it out, you tap it in, you take it out, you tap it in, you take it out, and slowly, slowly take it to the depth that, that, you, that you like. And then you have the bone expander. The bone expander is, you know, from here all the way to here, it goes from 3.0 and up. Basically, they will be the diameter of the implant. And you're running it at about 25 to 30 RPM. So the implant, if you, let's say you're placing a 4.0 diameter implant, you're gonna start with a 3.0, go to the 3.5, and then you go to the 4.0, and after the 4.0, you place your implant. And when you're expanding it, look at the, the vertical cut to make sure they are opening up, but they're not fracturing. Okay, so this is where you really have to take your time. And as you go in and out, when the osteotomy, you know, is, you know, when you're expanding it, the drill stop, reverse it right back out, 
um, because allow the air to pressure, release the pressure and allow the bone to, to stretch a little bit. So once you expand it, then you should be able to see a separation at the cut and that tells you you have increased the volume. And obviously this cut area, you need to fill it in with graft material before you close everything up. Now, some doctors don't like to use the hand pee to do the expansion. They like to use the torque wrench, which is totally fine. Um, I learned it with the torque wrench before I used the hand pee. Um, both ways work well. They both have their pros and cons. Uh, again, it is something that you have to see what works best in your hand as you as you you know do the expansion. And this this is the ratchet connector, the attachment onto the uh, expander. So to do a dry run, first and foremost, you do a flap. Once you have the flap, then you make sure you level off the crestal area, and you want to make sure you do have a minimum four millimeter buccal lingually. And once you see that, you will make an indentation in the area where the osteotomy will be. Once you do that, you will take the initial drill with the stopper of choice and make your osteotomy. And once you created the osteotomy, I usually like to take an x-ray to make sure I have my parallelism, everything looks good. Once that looks good, I will take the disc and I will start with the smallest disc and I will go straight down vertically where the osteotomy is. So I will divide the osteotomy in half. I do to all three of them and then I will connect all three of them. Okay. And once I do that, I go to the next diameter disc and then the next diameter disc as long as I have enough room to get that disc in there to create my vertical. The deeper the vertical I have, the easier it is to expand. If I'm in dense bone, very dense bone, then I will go ahead and do a cutting on the buckle side, which is the horizontal on the buckle and the vertical on the buckle. This gives me the little indentation of a millimeter all the way around. So when I do expand it, um, the chance of fracturing is controlled. So then after I do the vertical um, and the buckle horizontal, I will do the expansion with the bone chisel, take it to the depth that I need, Yes, in, out, in, out, slowly, take your time. And then now I will do the sequential bone expansion. Again, taking my time, watching the vertical area as it opens up. And then once it's all to the, the, the expansion the diameter that I need, I will place my implant, implant is placed, and then I wanna make sure I bone graft everything, membrane, and then primary closure suture everything up. And usually like this, I like to wait about six months before I restore it. Um, that allows the graft material to convert and around the, the area to heal properly. So now we have a video by Dr. Hub. He is the, uh, the founder of uh, um, Neobiotech and he did the surgery. And what I did is I basically uh, broken up the, the video a little bit by little bit. So at least hopefully you can see the step. Now what he did, he added an extra procedure because the bone was pretty narrow at the end. So he, he did, did some uh, uh, place a screw in that area. Uh, and usually um, I don't think you will, you will see that unless you start to do more and more uh, into more advanced cases, but this at least gives you an idea what uh, to do. So missing tooth number 30 and 31 with a narrow ridge. So the incision, ideally, you want to keep it on the attached gingiva so that when you do close it up, it heals faster and there's less discomfort on the patient. So he's opening up the whole area. When you make the flap, you want to make sure there's no soft tissue on the alveolar crest. Because if the soft tissue is introduced into the osteotomy and the, in the implant it, uh, impinge on it or bind it, um, guess what's gonna fill in first? It's not gonna be the bone, it's gonna be the soft tissue, okay? And so now we'll go ahead and get the, the oh, there we go. The 
the flattening, make sure the, the cresto area is leveled off, and also this helps remove any soft tissue too. You can see the procedure, everything that he's doing, there's a lot of water, a lot of irrigation, okay? My, there we go. Now the initial drill. So he did 30 and 31. Now he has the first this. Again, running it at about 1200. Some doctors like to run it a little bit slower, some a little bit faster, but I think, you know, if anything, I'd rather get no, no faster than 1200. If anything, I'd rather go a little bit slower. Okay, once that's done. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm having a little issue with my mouse. Okay, now we do the, the vertical and then the horizontal on buckle. You can see when he's doing this, he's staying away from the adjacent tooth. At least a, a one and a half mil. Okay. Oh, no. So all he did is just he hugged the bone, making sure the stopper is against the bone and create that, that little, that, that cut horizontally. Okay. Taking the chisel, slowly doing the expansion, going 30 and 31, back and forth. Okay, when he's doing the expansion, expansion, look at the irrigation. There's also irrigation. So keeping it cool is very, very important. You don't want to overstress the area or overheat the area. And look at the vertical cut area. You can see as, as he placed the expander in, it's slowly spreading a little bit, but it's not like it's going to break off. You can see the expansion. It just gives that slow, small enough elasticity to open up. And now placing the implant. Okay. Finishing placing the implant. Now, over here, he, what he does is just to make sure that this bone is not going to fracture, he placed a fixation screw in there. And that's something that's, that's you know, a little bit more advanced, but it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. If you're interested in doing these fixation, uh, next week I'm doing the GBR. Uh, this is part of the, uh, the GBR kit and Neobiotech guys, which is excellent. See, by placing the fixation screw, he keeps that bone in place. And if I can, I think my mouse is having an issue today. There we go. So as he placed the second implant, you can see as the bone will start to expand a little bit, but the fixation screw holds it in place and not allowing it to break.
Now it goes back to the first one and slowly hand torque that one in. You can see how much the expansion is from that from what it was before. It's quite a bit, but he's able to place in there two actual size implant. Not something small, but the right size implant, and then bone graft the whole thing. Just fill in all the void, cover everything up, and then the membrane, and then primary closure. Again, in that area, ideally. No, nothing compressing on on there, so you make it keep it stress free. And if you have a stress free, then the body will pretty much it's predictable; it will heal very nicely. But if you have compression over it, uh, it will fail. So be careful when you do something like that. Uh, don't give patient a denture or flipper. Have something that that, that basically has no stress or compression over it. Well, that is the end. I thank you for participating in, in this uh, webinar. Um, but it's just to show you that the ridge splitting has really come a long way. This kit has helped me tremendously. What makes it important is that vertical and horizontal cut. Um, it's important because that helped, uh, it's a game changer for me in a sense that in some cases where I thought I can't place the implant, I just have to do a regular GBR first. I was able to, to do the splitting and place the implant. Um, so it's very helpful in the sense that for the patient, they don't have to go through double surgery. So let's go to the uh, Q&A. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. I'm gonna go to uh, Q&A. All right. Let's go with the questioning. The first question, rather than an expansion, would you do a vertical release thing? That's a possibility, you can. Again, the biggest thing is, do I have the ability to place the actual or the right diameter implant in place? And this is, again, you as a practitioner, we as a practitioner, it is our call when we look at the situation to see you know, what is best. Um, in my hand, I find the ridge splitting, it's just, it's a no brainer, especially um, using this kit. It's very, very uh, user friendly for me. Uh, next question is, which of this product do you prefer? Split and expand the bridge and the implant osteotomy and put implants or implant osteotomy, split the bridge. Um, why put the implant and why? Um, oh, okay, I, I think your questioning is, um, what would I like to do? My thing is, I like to do as much as possible in one sitting and not to, and, and that one sitting, and not to drag on and make that surgery two, three hours. Remember, if the wound, once it's open, you don't want it to be contaminated. You wanna get in and get out. So, but I wanna be able to get in and do as much as I can so the patient doesn't have to come back and do a second surgery on top of it. Now, with that being said, if I have a patient that basically is, um, you know, like you saw in the slides where, one of the, the bone, it's just too thin, it's knife edge. Then I have to do two stages and the patient understands that. But if I can split it, place implant, why not? It just makes things easier for the patient and for myself in, in, in the long run. And also time, when you do wrist splitting and implant one time together, it's about give or take six months. If I do the GBR, it's about by the fifth month, I should be able to re remove the the titanium or remove the, the membrane, things like that, and then place the implant, then I have to wait another four months. So, you know, an extra, extra four months or so. But again, your comfort zone. What are you com comfortable in doing? Uh, some doctor want to be even more conservative, um, but with this rich splitting uh, tools that we have, I think it's quite conservative. Um, if Next question, if only two osteotomy sites to place, would you do the distal site first? Um, it really makes no difference. As long as um, you start on one side, you gotta go to the other side. You, uh, you like to do it together uh, if they are connected. Let's say if they are 18 and 19, if they're together. Now, if they are, let's say 18 and 20, um, again, I, I'll just start on one of them and then I'll do the other one. It, it makes no difference as far as, uh, because they're farther apart, 
um, it, 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 sh it should be fine. Um, next question, if the vertical and horizontal bone cut completely disengage from the main bone, would you still close normally? Closing meaning primary closure and everything. It's the important thing is, if that bone do come apart, um, let's say worst case scenario, I'm expanding it and then boom, that whole buckle plate just broke off. You know what I would do? And it does, and it has happened to me, not once, multiple times. I will still use that bone. I will then take the, my GBR kit out. I have the screw. I will take the retaining screw and what you just saw in the video, I'll go in there and secure that buckle plate. So it's immobilized, and that's a key thing. Make sure the buckle plate don't move. Secure in place, the implants are there, bone graft the area, membrane, which is key, and you have to achieve primary closure. You cannot leave it open. You've got to achieve primary closure so you don't get any contamination. Next question is, how long are the vertical cut? Great question. Um, usually, uh, let's say if I'm going in there, I'm gonna be placing an eight, eight millimeter implant. I would do probably an eight millimeter or maybe eight to 10 millimeter, a little bit longer, maybe. Okay, uh, within, within that range. If I'm doing 10 a millimeter length implant, I probably will do uh, maybe 11 or 12 millimeter vertical cut. So that gives it a little bit more elasticity in expanding. Next question, do you ever tack the membrane? Um, you know, I don't have to. In the old day, I did. Old day meaning I was taking the titanium mesh, placing it over, and then the membrane goes on top and I tacked it. In this situation, um, if the bones are intact, then the membrane uh, is secure well enough when I achieve primary closure. There shouldn't be any movement because it is not the membrane that's holding the bone. It is the buccal and lingual plate that's holding the bone in place. Uh, next question, how low the horizontal cut should be from the crest, same as your implant length? Uh, as the same, this is basically the same question as before. I usually like to go a little bit longer, at least a millimeter or two. Um, and if possible, can I use the kit for other brands of implant? <laughs> of course, yes. Because it's pretty much, you know, all the implant system coincide as long as they are tapered. Um, you know, 3.5, 4.0, 4.5, 5.0. Um, you know, the, the diameter size is all pretty universal. Great question. And the next question is, how deep is the crestal gingival cut? Um, it seems like the fixation screw is not uh, deep enough to engage the lingual side of the ridge. I'm pretty much in the middle. The fixation screw was in the middle um, uh, of, of that cut. Um, as far as the gingival cut, again, once I, once I do my vertical, then I, you know, wherever the, the ending is, I, I'll just follow through on that, creating a, a square U, so to, you know, so to say. Okay, and next question, okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Inga. I appreciate it. Um, let's go to chat. Um, how deep the horizontal cut should be? Uh, five millimeter from the bone crest or deeper? Can I use the kit for the other brand implant? You can use the kit for other brand implant. As far as the horizontal cut, um, it should be, I usually like to make it, again, Whatever the implant length is, I like to go at least maybe, if I can, two millimeter deeper. So if it's a 10, if it's an eight millimeter implant, I will make sure that a horizontal uh, um, buckle cut will be about 10 millimeters. Okay. And all right, I think that's it. Well. Thank you for attending, I appreciate it. Ayang, I think I need to bring it back to you now. Oh yeah, thank you doctor very much for your presentation. And um, if there's any further questions, um, you know, can email to Dr. Chan, uh, I think, um, doctor. So I will now right go ahead and to make, uh, let's see, here's a, an announcement. 
So we are seeing a having a special promotion on this rich wider kit that Dr. Chen was just mentioned in uh, his uh, lecture today. Um, and then there is a promo code. Uh, promo code is plat0514 uh, from last week. So and this promo code is expires on uh, May 20 May 28th. And you can purchase it on our website at www.neobiotechusa.com. And just, um, but before you have to just create an account on our website and just use that promo code here uh, again, PLAT, P-L-A-T-T 0514, this promo code at the checkout. And this rich wider key should be under, um, if you go to click on the, it's under the store. Um, it's under the store and then you can find this kit under the GBR tab. So, um, and here is the promo code again. And um, last thing that I want to mention is if you're, um, and this promo code is limited time offer and expires two weeks from um, uh, two weeks and then it will expire on May 28th. So don't miss out the special promotion. And if you are interested, please check with our sales rep as well. Um, they will send this info along with the course evaluation forms, or you can simply purchase it through our website. So here is the promo code once again. And also stay connected with us on social media. Most up to date of our information will, should be on our social media. So here's a Facebook page in Neobiotech USA. And then here's Instagram, Neobiotech should be underscore USA. And also YouTube channel is Neobiotech USA. So please follow us. And if you are interested in taking our webinars in the future, you can find upcoming webinars in our website and click the webinar at the top right here and you should be on our webinar page. And we have another webinar today at two o'clock in Pacific Coast time with Kent Huang on how to start surgical placement of dental implants part one. And also we are having a webinars every Monday and Thursday. Um, so the date is um, Mondays and Thursday from 11 to 12, and then the one in the afternoon from 2 to 3 p.m. So all these courses are first come, first serve basis. So please register in advance and reserve your spot. So for Dr. Chen, uh, his webinar, he will be lecturing on fundamental of reach augmentation with GBR on May 28th, which is Thursday at 2 o'clock. So also save these things. And you can find up this upcoming webinars on our website right here. And so this is the, to the uh, this week's webinar on Thursday. Um, the Dr. Kent Huang will be lecturing on the part two of the how to compete a dental implant restoration for beginners at 11 a.m. in the morning and then in the afternoon the same day with Dr. Owen Trin on all on X. So also please register those two courses because they fill really fast. And here's more webinars as well. You can find it on our, on our website. The first one is on the May 25th on Monday with Dr. Spencer Park on the guided implant surgery. And then the same day afternoon with Dr. Smiler and on the session one of the planning and surgery for extra maxillary tagma. And also on Thursday of the, the week after that, um, um, it's with the Dr. Smile as well on session two of the maxillary uh, technique. And also uh, with, lastly with Dr. Chen, it's on Thursday, May 28th at two o'clock on the GBR. And now you can watch our previous webinars on our website if you uh, miss uh, some of our uh, great lectures. And you should, you should uh, be seeing all these webinars under this previous webinars, you can click on here on our web page. And also, thank you very much for those who stayed until the end. And we really uh, need your feedbacks. And so we are uh, one of our sales rep will email you the link to complete the course evaluation form. So after you receive it, please fill it out as soon as possible. Um, and this form should no longer take five minutes. It's very simple.
and should be looks like this right here. And thank you very much again for participating into this webinar and we really hope to see you again next time. And feel free to contact me if you have any further questions. Here's my email, iom.chui at neobiotechusa.com. And I wanna say again, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen again. And thank you all the doctors who participated in this webinars. Thanks a lot, Doc, and have a great week. I really, thank you, doctor, and thank I really you, hope everyone could have a, a wonderful day as well.